Well, super pumped for this conversation today. And uh, to get things started, um, I want to tell you uh, just real quick about something cool that I got to experience. Pretty simple, but it just it meant the world to me. So uh, my best friend in the world, uh, other than my wife, Rachel, is my brother, David. And uh, David's my big brother. Um, anybody here have a big brother? Come on. Some of you guys are like, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I know, the, I know the emotions, I know the feelings. Well, David is my big bro, and we've had those, you know, sometimes I love him, sometimes I hate him, but we're, we're very close in age, and then we're also very close in, uh, in size and stature, uh, and so me and David, yeah, weird, and me and David are always, you know, really competitive. Anytime we get around, anything becomes a competition. Like, I could, like, grab this paper and be like, let's see who can fold it the best or the most times. So, you know what I mean? It's just, like, silliness, but uh, we connect so well and always have growing up, so he came to visit us here in Oklahoma. He lives in Arizona, came out here. And he was like, I thought I was leaving the heat <laughs> and came here. Uh, and so he came and hung out for a little bit. And it just, it meant the world. We had such a great time, uh, made some new memories, hung out with friends from the past. And yeah, just had a blast. Uh, well, when David had left, dropped him off at the airport. And when he, I was driving home, I just had like this impression just placed on my heart uh, of just how great of a time I just had with my brother. You ever had that, like hanging out with some people and you just, you you leave and you're like, wow, that was great, you know? Um, And it was so heavy that truthfully, I was like in shock about how good I felt about the time that I just had. Does that make sense? Like it left me kind of like, dude, why do I feel this good about what I just experienced? Uh, And that's how I felt. I felt that way after he had left. Again, just so much fun, so much, so much great conversation, deep, real conversation, good connection with him. Uh, And so him leaving was, was sad, but I felt so good about it. So much so that it, it pretty much just shocked me, like how excited and, 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 and amazing I felt from that time with him. Uh, and so the more I thought on that, I started wondering like, why? why? Why did that feel like such a big deal to me? He's my brother, you know, we've known each other our whole lives. And so it was like, why is it that it was such a shock that I, like, about this time I had with him? And what the Lord had revealed to me is, hey, this is not what you experience on the regular. This, this in-depth, authentic, great community that you just experienced with your brother is actually a rarity oftentimes in your life. Has anybody else ever seen, experienced that? Where, where this community that we have and getting to hang out with somebody or a group of people, you leave and you're just like, that was so amazing. And you wonder, why is that? And I think the reason being is because it's rare to experience real, good, deep community with somebody or with some people is not as frequent as we might think or hope it would be. Oftentimes, the opposite is, is the frequent experience. Our normal experience with people, with community, and in relationship is often much shorter. It's often much more surface level. You know what I'm talking about? Think about, think about the world we live in today, right? Think about the relationships that we have. So much relational interaction happens online, right? Anybody have social media? All of us have social media, right? And so <clears throat> nobody raised their hands, guys. We're not lying in church today, okay? But it's the thing, right? We comment, we like, we do all that kind of stuff. We, oh, how are you doing? Or real quick, doing great. Okay, talk to you in a couple of years. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it, that's how we interact so much nowadays. It's online, on social media. Our shopping is done online. Praise God for Walmart pickup orders, okay? I'm not, that's it. Amen, let's go. Now, <clears throat> but that's, it's a real thing, right? But it is done online. We don't have to go through and see people and like hide from people in the, you know, in the rows and going back. You know what I'm talking about. We don't have to do that anymore. Just, you know, Pull up, keep the windows tinted, we're good. Our banking is done online. You, don't need, you just get to scan checks, right? If you're in my generation, you're like, what is a check, right? But <clears throat> we don't even have to do that. You don't have to go see the teller face to face. You can just do it all online. Church is even done online, which is great. Makes a noise for our online family. Come on, they're the best. I really pointed at you aggressively, but I love that you're here. But it is a thing. So many things that we experience and we do, our interactions with others is done in a different way that is not face-to-face. It's a little more surface level. And these aren't bad things. Church online is not a bad thing. Online shopping and banking and, and social media aren't necessarily all bad things. They're great things. And there's blessing and resource in the midst of all of those. Praise God. Amen. But what if we lean into that too much? What if we lean into that too far to the point that we're missing out on some beneficial things, some resources, and some gifts that God has in this deep person-to-person group, in-person interaction, the in-person connection and community that we so often miss out on? What if we're missing out on major blessings in the midst of that? Because I think we are. The way I think of it is like a swimming pool, okay? Anybody go swimming this summer? You had to to survive out here. 
Uh, so my kids took some swimming lessons. Uh, Sean, actually, the guy you saw in the, in the announcement video, he helped uh, teach them and, and, and get them going. And now they're fish, basically, okay? They just they hang out in the pool, and all they do is swim. Uh, <clears throat> well, one thing uh, uh, is when they first started learning how to swim, uh, we would do like floaties and like, you know, get into the deeper waters and teach them, you know, tread water, keep going, like kick your arms, kick your feet, like just, you know, getting out there. You got it, you got it, you got it. Keep going, keep going. And they hit a place where they'd be like, okay, can I go to the shallow end now? You know what I mean? It's like, I just want to, it's like, why? It's like, you got floaty, you're good. You're not going to drown. We got you, right? It's like, no, no, but I just, can I go to the shallow end now? And then we're like, okay, you can go to the shallow end. And what we realized is we get them over there and they go to the side, they take off their floaties and they just chill. You know, they'd be in the shallow end where they could stand and they could chill. It's like, why are you guys doing that? Like, we don't like to, like, look at the deep end. You can swim all around it. You can jump in all kinds of stuff. And what we came to realize is the shallow end is easier, right? You can go to the shallow end and you don't have to put as much effort swimming in the shallow end. There's not as much risk when it comes to swimming in the shallow end. It's a little more comfortable in the shallow end. It feels like you can just be you in the shallow end. I think the same is true when it comes to how we perceive community. As we see the deep end, deep, authentic, real conversations in community where we have to be honest and transparent and other people get to know us and we get to know them and it's a little bit scary. It looks like it requires a bit more work. It looks like it's a little bit more risky. It's a little bit more uncomfortable and maybe we're a little bit too busy for all of that and so we go over to the shallow end and say, we'll just hang out here. We like it to be easy. We like the surface level kind of vibe over here in the pool, just like we do with our community. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Maybe the reason that we avoid that deep, authentic community is because we've experienced pain and hurt from other people. Maybe communities in the past weren't all that they were, you know, built up to be. We've been hurt by people who said they loved us and cared for us. And they weren't the community that we hoped for. Maybe it's just an uncomfortable thing. And, and, and that's not my personality. I'm not really about that. It makes me super uncomfortable to where I can't even experience or enjoy anything in it. And if that's us, what we start to do is to lean into some lies that maybe community just isn't for me at all. Maybe it's just me and myself and I, and I will be okay. I understand it. Community can be very, very hard. There's a, uh, a recent Harvard study that shows that one in three Americans struggle and face loneliness and isolation. A third of us in this room, right? That's what they're saying. One in three Americans struggle with loneliness. And not just loneliness and feeling alone, but all that comes with that. We know that, right, church? The mental health issues that can come with that. The, the anxiety, the depression, the doubt, all kinds of stuff that can come with that. When we think and truly believe that we're alone in this world, that nobody's got our back, nobody cares for us, nobody loves us the way that other people might be loved, but it's just me. That's a dangerous and scary place to be, but it's a very real place for so many of us. But community is needed. Community is important. And again, not, not the shallow, surface level community, the deep, authentic community. We need it. In fact, I would go as far to say with, with 100% confidence that that's how God created it to be, is we are called to each other. We are called to do life together with one another. You're like, yeah, but dude, community is so hard. Like, people are mean. I know it, dude. And you're like, oh, community's not that bad. Try playing Monopoly with some of your friends. See if you're still friends after six hours. You know what I mean? We've, it, it gets dangerous out here, man. You know what I mean? It's, it's crazy. People are hard. It's the real thing. Community is hard because people are hard. We don't always treat each other the way we should be treated. We don't always treat each other with love and grace and kindness. We make mistakes towards one another. Amen. We hurt one another. Who's ever been hurt by somebody? Amen. Who's ever hurt somebody? Amen. It's a very real thing, but we need one another. We are created for one another. So the question then is why? And that's what we're going to answer and take a look at today. To do that, I want to talk about how, again, we're called together. I keep saying that we are called together. God has created us to do life with one another. And I'll give you a couple examples, a couple of examples that we see in Scripture where God just, he, he blesses this and he, he makes an importance on it. The first one comes uh, from the early church in the book of Acts. So Acts 2, uh, verses 44 to 47 it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had needs, taking care of one another. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. 
those who are being saved. So we see in, in this passage here that God is placing priority and blessing and this, and painting this big, beautiful picture in the early church of what community should look like. It's people gathering day by day. They're meeting needs for one another, helping one another. They're, they're, they're having joy with one another. They're eating dinner. They're going, church. they're going to church together, right? They are connecting consistently, constantly being in relationship. And it's something that God established at the beginning of his church. And if you go even earlier to the very beginning, Genesis 2.18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him, right? So you got Adam and Eve in this picture that God creates Adam and he, re- and he comes to this place of saying, hey, this, this isn't how it's going to be. It's not good for you to be by yourself and to try to figure this out alone. You need more. You need each other. You need people around you who can love you. And so we're gonna give you a helper. We're gonna give you more people in your life. It is a part of God's plan across the board community, relationship, being together, doing life together. So then the question now is why is doing life together in a deeper way and not just the surface level social media type of way, why is it important that we pursue that? So I want to give you four reasons why. I want to talk about what together brings, four things. The first thing that together brings is encouragement. Taking notes, together brings encouragement. We're going to talk about Moses and Joshua throwing it back to the Old Testament. So some background on this. Uh, God has revealed to Moses, if you, if, if you know about Moses, he's the, he's the friend who came in and he got the Egyptians, right? God used him to bring the Egyptians out of slavery into freedom. Uh, and they actually ended up wandering in the desert. I just can't even imagine being Moses, right? It's like, comes in, God uses him, brings him out. And it's like, all they do is the opposite of everything God asked them to do. It's like, hey, do this. No. You know, it's like, come on, man, toddlers. And so it's, it's a huge frustration, but Moses went through it with these people. And eventually after wandering for 40 years, they get to this place where God's going to bring them into the promised land. And if you're Moses, you're like, oh, thank you, Lord. Finally, we get to be where you've promised us we're going to end up. And he goes, actually, not you. You know what I mean? It's this moment he's asking the Lord, Lord, I would love to go into the promised land and see all that you've promised and experience this with your people. And God says, no. Right? And there's some reasons behind that as to why and whether that's disobedience from Moses and and God's like, that's just not it. Or also God's just, he moves through and he changes things and he brings in new leadership, which is what he does with a man named Joshua. And so God tells Moses, you won't come in and see the promise. You won't be be able to experience the promised land and enter in. You can go to the mountain and see it, but the person who will lead our people, lead my people into the promised land will be Joshua. And so again, if you're Moses, you're like, man, maybe deep down that's, that's that's gotta sting a little bit, right? Well, here's how Moses responds to Joshua. Here's what he says uh, as, as he is being commanded to take lead of God's people and lead them into the promised land. It's Deuteronomy 31. You know, we read from that? We sure do. Deuteronomy 31, seven through eight. So then Moses called for Joshua and all Israel watched. He said to him, be strong and courageous for you will lead these people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors he would give them. You are the one who will divide it among them as their grants of land. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. This is a beautiful moment from Moses to Joshua. Again, if you're Moses, it's like, man, I'm missing out on this huge thing that we've been wandering around trying to get to for 40 years, right? All because of us, but it stinks. But that's not how he responds. Moses' initial thing is to come to Joshua and bring encouragement. He says, hey, it's not me anymore. You're the guy. You're the one who's gonna lead God's people into this promised land. It almost feels like the finish line. You get to walk them. I've been leading the whole race, getting through, and we're in the last quarter mile, and you get to lead them across the finish line. And I believe in you. And God has called you to do this. Be strong and courageous. Trust him with all that you've got. Follow his leading. You're going to do this. You're going to go and you're going you're to separate the lands. You're going to lead the people well. You've got this. Moses chooses to trust and obey God, and he chooses to love Joshua and encourages him in his leadership. He says, go and do these things that God has for you. This is the kind of encouraging community that we need. When we're gathered with a community that is healthy and it's deep and it's focused and, fall, and, and, and it pursues the Lord, we'll, we'll experience this kind of encouragement. In these kind of communities, God will, God will use these people in our lives to remind us, like Moses did for Joshua, of, of our value. 
God will use this community in our life to remind us of the calling he's placed. How many times do you go throughout your day? I know I do in so many seasons where I wonder, is this really who I am, God? Am I, am I called to do this thing? And oftentimes God will bring somebody else in and goes, hey, you're absolutely called to do this thing. You're amazing and God loves you so much and he's got great things for you. Trust him, lean on him, right? To bring that encouragement, keep moving forward in this. God uses these people to counter lies in our lives, right? I mean, we don't see this specifically, but you can imagine if you're Joshua, you're like, man, this is tough. This is, I don't think I'm capable. I'm not fit out. Moses himself had these moments at the beginning of when God called him to lead his people out of Egypt. It's like, don't believe those lies. The enemy's telling you you're not enough. The enemy's telling you that you can't do this, that you don't have the skills or abilities. Guess what? You don't, but God does. So trust him. Be strong and courageous. God is with you. We need people to remind us of these things in our lives. We were made to encourage one another and to help each other forward. So I uh, had a, a friend uh, probably about a month and a half ago. I was just in a, a weird week and, and felt pretty overwhelmed with all that was going on and was, was in that space of just of, of kind of doubting, doubting where I was, who I was, and the callings and questions. And, and uh, I had a friend just text me randomly one day and was like, hey, um, I just want to tell you, you're great. You're doing a great job. And I'm thankful, and she, she's a part of our ministry, so I'm thankful you're uh, uh, the leader of, uh, of our student ministry. And it just, it meant the world. It was super kind, super caring, and it, it meant a lot that somebody would reach out and go, hey, just want to let you, you know that you're doing a great job. It, it, it helps you, it lifts you up, it, it reminds you of some truth when so many lives just want to drown out what, what's going on in here. We need to encourage one another. And one of the things I love specifically about about this encouragement in authentic and, and deep community is when somebody comes to encourage us and it's in a healthy manner, it has nothing to do with them. Does that make sense? It's solely focused on you. Hey, hey I'm, this doesn't matter, but I just want to tell you, you know, it's coming from me because, you know, if I say something, it's good, right? No, 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 no. I just want you to know how great you are and how loved and important you are. I want, to, I want you to leave this room, this conversation, lift it up feeling loved and important and, and just seen by your heavenly father. Amen, church? We need encouragement in our lives. We need people. We need to be together to bring that encouragement. Second thing that together brings is support. Like, sounds kind of similar. It does, but stick with me on this. So we're going to talk about David and Jonathan, uh, still in the, in the Old Testament, but let me give you some background on this. So uh, this is David who would become king from shepherd boy to king, uh, and he has not become king yet, but he has been anointed to become king. Uh, so he's, he's in the pursuit of that. It's, it's, he's taking steps, uh, all while basically trying, uh, being uh, uh, Saul. King Saul is attempting to kill him, okay? So David is having to dodge spears while playing the harp, all kinds of stuff, man. Saul is is not a fan of David because the anointing that God first placed on Saul as king has been removed and he knows David's coming in to take his throne, right? That's God's will for it all and that's frustrating and makes Saul angry. And so uh, as time goes on and Saul continues to try to kill David and he's dodging spears and all that, uh, <clears throat> David begins to just gain rep. Like his reputation just goes. He becomes a mighty warrior. He just becomes an, an amazing leader. People are cheering for him, like can't wait for him to be king. All this kind of stuff. People love David and it just makes Saul even angrier, right? So there becomes this point where David and, and some of his mighty warriors, they're, they're kind of on the run from Saul because he's got the whole army tracking David down, trying to kill him. And uh, David hits a low point. It's a really low point while he's running from Saul where he's kind of not seeing a way out. And he's like, I think Saul's going to get me, man. Like, this is, this is pretty rough. And you see the hope begin to dwindle. Well, David has a friend named Jonathan. And Jonathan is actually the son of Saul. And uh, Jonathan and David have been like this the whole time. Well, Jonathan comes up and he, uh, he talks to David in this weak moment. And here's what he says. This is 1 Samuel 23, verse 15. One day uh, near Horesh, David received the news that Saul was on the way to Ziph to search for him and kill him. Jonathan went to find David, and check this out, and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. Don't be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. My father will never find you. You are going to be the king of Israel, and I will be next to you, as my father Saul is well aware. You see the support from his friend crazy, right? First thing that Jonathan does, the way that he lifts David up and supports him, it's, it's, it's even more than just encouraging words, is he reminds his friend of how he gets through this. And the first thing he does is says, hey, the first way you get through this, the support that you need comes from your heavenly father. Look to God. Have faith in God. Sure, Saul's army's coming. You guys might not match. He might have the upper hand on you, but nobody has the upper hand on God. Look to God. 
Seek the Father. Seek time with him. Understand him. Invite him in. Know that he's got you. Trust him with all of this. Have faith in our heavenly Father's abilities, right? So he points David to the Father. That's his first support. The second support, he says, hey, you've got God, and don't forget, you've got me. I'm right here. Doesn't that change everything? When, when, when you feel like you're alone and you're walking out a really hard time. You ever been in a hard time before, church? And it feels like you're walking it out alone, that nobody cares, nobody understands. And when somebody comes in and goes, I'm right here. Whatever you need. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stand here, even if it means that I might lose somewhere else, right? A relationship with my father, right? My earthly father, this relationship might not be the same after this. I'm right here. And they're willing to sacrifice and serve and, and, and be there for you to support you in that time. We need Jonathans in our lives. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. We need Jonathans. We need people that when the going gets tough, they don't get going. They stay right there. They're with us through thick and through thin. They show up for us. Not, they don't just encourage us and, and, and say that things are going to be all right, but they stand with us through it until it is. And most importantly, we need those Jonathans who are going to point us to God, the one who makes all the difference. Sometimes God wants to use those people in our lives to remind us of our need for him, that he is the support system that makes a difference, that he is the hope for our souls our need for him, our, of his strength, of his love and his grace, our need for his direction and his guidance. God wants to use your neighbor, your friends to help you remember that because we need it sometimes. So together, it brings encouragement. Together brings support. Point number three, together brings healing. This is a two-part one. Uh, I like this one. T together brings healing. Starts in Galatians 6. Check this out. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are, not, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Amen? Amen? It's a tough one, right? Don't forget, you are not that important. Just some truth for all of us in regards to how we care for others and, and the priority we place on ourselves and those around us. Just a big picture. And I love uh, in, in verse two, right? Uh, share each other's burdens and in this way, obey the law of Christ. This heavy weight that is placed here on, on the importance of caring for one another, helping one another, prioritizing one another, right? We're fulfilling the law of Christ, it says. It's such a big deal. Part of who God is and what he sent his son to do for us, to be that ultimate sacrifice, to help and carry the burdens, all of our burdens in his own way. So the, the, the piece of this that I really want to focus on though is that first verse. If another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. The first way that together brings healing oftentimes is through correction. Correction. A lot of times for me, I've had, I've had people in my life, if I've been in a weird spot who have come to me and go, hey, that was not it. You know what I'm talking about? People who hold you accountable, people who come in and say, hey, you, I love you, but you're being dumb. It's a real thing and we need it, right? The way you're walking this out is not it. And it's not a hateful thing. It's not, they just want to see you fall apart, but I care for you. And because I care for you, I need to know that this sin that you're walking in, this brokenness that you're allowing to continue to happen in your life, and you're just kind of pursuing maybe even, it can't be the thing anymore. Sometimes we need correction. Sometimes we need some truth from our friends, from our, from our circles, from our communities, because it brings healing, right? The truth can bring healing, and it should be done in a way that is gentle and it's humble. It's, it's, it's not to, to boast one other person up who brings the truth or to tear another person down, but because it's what's best for us. So when I was in high school, uh, I had a friend, and I still have this friend today. His name is Ed Muniz. You might know him, okay? Uh, well, Ed and I had uh, English class together, um, and uh, I think it was our senior year, and uh, there was a moment where um, I'm just going to be brutally honest. I was talking terribly about somebody, um, and I was uh, basically making fun of them. Not basically, I sure was. I was making fun of this person, and um, I do all this, and I'm getting people to laugh, you know, felt good, because, uh, you know, getting people to laugh, having a good time, and uh, I get done doing that, start to focus on some work, and I look over um, to my, my right side, I believe, and, and Ed is sitting over here, and he's just looking at me. Uh-huh. <laughs> and all he says is, that's fake. And then he turns back to his paper, and he starts writing, and I was like, he sure did. 
And I told, I told Ed about this. He didn't know this, but that shook me. It did, right? And you see, Ed didn't come in, and he's like, oh, you know, flipping tables. How dare you? You know what I mean? It was very subtle, very chill. Just, hey, just need you to know what you just did. That was wrong. And went back his way. And mine and Ed's relationship from that point on wasn't like gross. He didn't, he didn't ignore me or not talk to me or treat me badly. He didn't go tell a bunch of people. I mean, I don't think so, uh, that, that I had done that thing, right? Because it never came back up to me that way. He didn't tell a bunch of people, oh, Ricky's a terrible person. Don't talk to Ricky. Avoid Ricky. He's fake. All I never received any of that from that situation. But I had a friend show up in a moment and go, that's not it. And it shook me and God used that to change some stuff in my heart and the perspective I had on other people and how important they are, how beautiful they are, how, how great they are and how loved they are by God the same way I am and how I'm not above any of them, any of us ever. I needed that moment and it meant the world. It means the world now. We need those people. We need Ed's in our lives. And we're like, you're acting fake. You're not being who God has called you to be. And I still love you. I don't want to tear you down. I want to see you do better. I want to see you be where God has called you to be because he's called you to be there. We need those eds. We need those people who bring healing through truth, through correction. So that's part number one of healing, okay? Together brings healing through correction. Together also brings healing through confession, okay? Go hand in hand. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. A healthy and deep community is one where I or anyone else can bring my mess, my brokenness, my sin, my mistakes, and not feel condemned, Amen. not feel ashamed, not feel unworthy or unwelcome. That's not how the kingdom of God works. That's not how Jesus works, right? Just bring it to me. And we, as followers of Jesus, should represent him well that when people bring us their brokenness, we don't turn away but we love them and we show grace, right? Now, does grace mean that we give them get out of jail free cards? No, we just talked about the truth and the need for the truth, right? And we, a while back, if you were here at Grace for a while, we, we did this whole thing where we talked about grace and truth and, and Jesus is this beautiful paradox of, of complete grace and truth. He is both. And we as his followers are called to, to represent that well and, and to be a mix as much as we possibly can, but we need him. So we gotta do that in our communities. When people show up, we show them grace. We say, hey, thank you for being transparent. Thank you for being honest and, and opening up about what is deep and dark inside of you because that's the first step into finding freedom. And then what we do is we lead them by the hand to Jesus and say, hey, I love you so much and I'm so thankful you shared that with me. You should share it with your savior who wants to help you be free from that thing. Come on, you got this and we're gonna help you. We're gonna support you, right? We're gonna keep encouraging you, reminding you the moments that you don't get it right and bring truth, but with grace, no condemnation, no hate, no anger. That's where life change comes in. That's where healing comes in. When we show that grace and people bring that confession and when we bring that confession to those around us. Don't get caught up in this lie that uh, for some of us, I've felt this before, you're, you've been a Christian for too long to keep confessing things. Not true. The moment we stop, the moment we start to lose, we gotta, we gotta tell people what's going on in our hearts because that is where freedom is found. That is where healing is found. And God has given us one another, right? Like it says in James, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that we can come together and lift each other up to Jesus and say, God, do what only you can do because we're done with this stuff. We don't want it anymore. Change us, make us better. Make our friend better, God. We want what you have for them and for us. He healthy, deep community, it brings healing to me, to them, to you, to all of us through Jesus. Amen? Together brings healing. And the fourth one, together brings joy. Together brings joy. Acts 2, we're going back to that Acts 2 passage, uh, verse 46 and 47. It says, and day by day again, uh, the early church, they had, uh, attending the temple, going to church together, breaking bread, eating dinner in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Take a look right there at the end of verse 46. Glad and generous hearts. Uh, another translation, I believe it's the NLT, says with, with great joy and generosity. With great joy. They gathered with great joy. There's this insane and kind of just, just crazy truth that when we gather 
in a way that God has called us to, and we enter into real, deep, healthy, healthy community, we experience joy from the Lord. It's the reality. Together brings that joy. So we, uh, Rachel and I have some friends. They are the Thompsons, and they're actually, they have to put up with us as next door neighbors, just the truth. God has blessed us, and you know, for them, yeesh. But we get to, uh, we started to do, do some life with them, and they are first class. They are the best, and we're beyond thankful for them. We're beyond thankful that we get to spend time with them, uh, and we get to go over oftentimes. Matt is a, a tremendous cook, so just ask him, okay? Uh, no, but we get to be invited over, and when we hang out with them or they come over to our house and we all spend time together, every time we come back home from spending time with them, Rachel and I sit for a minute and we go, that was great, you know? It's like we just, like we come back home and we're, we're filled up right? We got to have real conversations about life. We got to, we got to share things with them. We, get, we got to be honest and do some confession. They got to be honest and bring some correction or vice versa or whatever, just some wisdom to the situations. We got to feel encouraged and supported, right? They tell us how they believe in us. They, they, they teach us new things. We get to grow with them in this community. And we come home and we feel like we've been given life. That's what real community does. It gives you life. God uses that community to bring life into our lives where so many other things are trying to bring in death or pull us away or make us feel empty and lonely. This is a blessing, a gift from God, and we need it. And in the midst of all it, he wants to bring us joy. God wants to see you smile. He does. And he wants to see you smile in a group of people who are also smiling, loving you, loving each other, loving him. He wants joy for us. And we have a chance to choose that. And one way we can do that is by surrounding ourselves with other people who care for us and love us, who strive to do it in a way that Jesus does. Together brings joy. God has joy for you, for me, for us. And oftentimes he gives it through those around us. We need each other. We need together. A couple things and I'll be done. Really two steps for us. And it might be different based on where you are in this journey of community and and maybe even your walk with the Lord. But the first thing I want to challenge all of us to do is if we're not into community, to enter. Enter into community, right? For some of us, this entering may mean, look back to the pool. Maybe you're one of those people who uses the ladder and you go step by step because the water's cold, right? (laughs) It's like, I got to take it slow. I'm not comfortable. This is a little tough for me, but I'm going to get in there. I'm just going to take my time. Maybe you love community, but it's, it, things have gotten busy and the busyness is giving you an excuse to step away. It's time to turn around and cannonball back into that community. Go to the deep end. Be a part of that. Look for that authenticity, for that deepness. Join a community. If you don't know uh, of a place to start, I'll give you one. If you look in, in your bulletin, got these little papers. We want to take that out real quick. Take a look at it. So it says... Uh, on the, on the face there it says, share each other's burdens and in, the way, in this way, obey the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2, we talked about that. So what this is, is it's an opportunity for you to take a step. Um, if you are not in a community and maybe God is tugging at those heartstrings and saying, you gotta find your people because I've got them for you. There's time for you to go, go be with them. This is an opportunity to, to surrender that to the Lord, to invite him into this as he helps you find that community. You don't have to take any other action step except we just encourage you to write your name, right? It's the step of of filling it out and then checking that box saying, I am praying about joining a life group. And take that time and pray. Put this on your mirror. Put this on your dashboard. Put it somewhere you're going to see it. And throughout this week to pray about it because here uh, soon we're going to have a life group launch going on. And we're going to have groups open for you to enter into. And and there's tons of different groups with tons of different ages and and tons of different uh, people who are in different stages of life and, you know, young adults and parents and, and all kinds of stuff. So if that's you and you're looking for that, take this, pray about it, ask God to show you. Don't just rely on your own understanding, right? Rely on his. Seek him and ask for his help to show you, God, where where do I need to go? How does this work with my schedule, Lord? Make it work with my schedule, Jesus, and get plugged into a life group. We truly believe in doing life together at Grace, and that's why we have these life groups. And if you want to be a part of one, we're going to get you in one, ASAP. We want to see more of them. We want to see more people getting plugged into this healthy community that God has called us to. And I'm not saying the life groups are the only way. Maybe God calls you to do something else. Maybe God's calling you to lead, right? So for some of us, it's enter. And the way we enter in is is by joining a group. For some of us, the entering is leading. Maybe God is calling you to build a community, that there's an opportunity. And and you've had those experiences where people have poured into you and you've been around the circles and you've kind of been the quiet one. And now God's saying, hey, it's time to step up. It's time for you to be the voice in there. 
to lead people and to show them the love that you've been given through other people that he's placed in your life. So maybe it's time for you to build a community, to lead a community with God and his help. You can do that too. And there's opportunity for that here. Or maybe it's elsewhere, however God wants to do it. But this is important. Take that step, pray on it, surrender it to the Lord and ask him for his guidance. Amen? Last thing. And this was just on my heart because I know I've, I've been in this spot is some of us, one of the biggest things that's holding us back from, from entering is we have yet to exit. Maybe there's some relationships, some community in your life if we're being just brutally honest that we've got to step out of before we can enter into the healthy stuff, right? That doesn't mean these people are bad people because they are loved by God just like you are, just like I am, just like we all are, right? But they're in a different direction. They're in a different space. And, and we know that we're not bringing benefit to them, that they're not bringing benefit to us. Whatever, that, whatever the reasons may be, maybe we just weren't called to have those relationships with these people because the truth is, is we're not called to be everybody's best friend, right? We're called to love one another, but God has people for us. So asking God, God, what, what do I need to exit out of? What do I need to enter into, Lord? Who do you have for me? Give me strength, give me guidance, give me boldness, all that I need, Jesus. Because I wanna do it your way because your way, it brings encouragement. Your way, it brings support. Your way brings healing and it brings joy, God. And it can only come from you. Enter, exit, whatever step he calls you to take. But let's get into the deep end, amen? Let's do life together.